be Appendix 2, starting on page A7, the very back of the book. A7, Appendix 2. So we've got a lot of different substances listed in Appendix 2 here. I'm just going to pick, uh, what should I do here? Let's pick a good one at random. How about aluminum oxide? Is that right there on the front page? There. So as it turns out, these compounds are listed alphabetically by cation, except when they're not. That's usually the way they're listed. If not, just kind of look around until you find your chemical that you're interested in. On our very first page here, A7, everybody see where Al2O3 solid is? Yep. And notice there's uh, three values listed next to it, a delta HF, that's what we're looking for today. There's also a delta GF, that's change in Gibbs free energy, and S0, that's entropy. Do you want to learn about Gibbs free energy and entropy? Gen Chem 2. It all becomes apparent later. But we're going to focus in on Gen Chem 2 on that delta HF value, which notice is a negative 1675.7. What are the units for that? We'll look up at the top there. Delta HF, turns out all these values are KJs per mole. Say so what? Just so an F3. No. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. First, I'm going to correct my delta. That's a sad delta. There. Now, why did I get rid of the F? Because heats of formation are actually delta H's for a specific reaction. In the case of aluminum oxide here, what the heat of formation is would be the delta H of the reaction to produce aluminum oxide from its constituent elements in their standard state. That's what all heat of formation values are. The delta H to produce that material from its constituent elements in their standard state. In the case of aluminum oxide, the constituent elements are obviously aluminum and oxygen. But they've got to be in their standard state. What is the normal state of aluminum under standard conditions, room temperature and atmospheric pressure? It's a solid. How would you know that? Wouldn't it be nice if there was some chart in the room that had color-coded things that would let you know what the standard state of materials were? There it is right there. Your wish is my command, Travis. There it is. So the standard state for aluminum, as we can see over there, aluminum is black. Black means it is solid under room temperature and one atmosphere conditions. Oxygen, on the other hand, being red, is a gas. I think Ruth had an extra correction for us. Is oxygen O normally? O2. There we have it. So there it is. Here's the chemical reaction showing the formation of aluminum oxide from its constituent elements in their standard states. Any other problems? It's not balanced. What do we need to do to balance this thing? Oh, we need two aluminums on each side. We need three oxygens here. So we obviously need one and a half oxygens, right? Three halves O2? That's it. Oh, by the way, remember when I told you you couldn't use fractional coefficients to balance chemical equations? I lied. You can. But only in thermodynamics. Only. So everywhere else, you still have to balance chemical equations properly and get rid of those fractions. But in thermodynamics, for a reason that will become apparent shortly, it is okay here to leave fractional coefficients. Now, why is it okay? Well, look at our units again. So our delta H here is kilojoules, I'll talk about that in a minute, per mole. Moles of what? Aluminum oxide. If I'd actually balance this correctly, I'd have to multiply everything by 2 here, and that would give me 2 moles of aluminum 
oxide. We can't do that here. This delta HF here is kilojoules per one mole. So in thermodynamics, when we're doing equations like this, we have to ensure we only have one mole of our product. And if that means we need fractional coefficients over here, then so be it. We have to have only one mole of our product. There. Now what about kJs here, kilojoules? What is the deal there? Well, the deal with kJs there is we have a unit for energy. We haven't talked about energy yet, so we haven't talked about the SI unit for it. The SI unit for energy is the joule. And joule is abbreviated capital J. It's named after a guy, so we capitalize that J. Turns out a joule is a very, very small amount of energy, so we seldom actually see joules. What we typically use is going to be kilojoules. Lowercase k for kilo and capital J for joules. So when we talk about energy, it will typically be measured in kilojoules. That's our SI unit. It's kind of hard to define exactly where the joule came from. It's kind of a weird definition. So I'm actually going to define the joule through its old English equivalent, which is actually much more sensible. You guys have heard of the old English unit for energy. It's the calorie. And calories have a very nice definition to them. Just for a change, we have a nice sensible definition for an old English measurement. A calorie is simply the energy needed to warm up one gram of water by one degree C. And of course, you guys are used to seeing calories. Calories are how they indicate how much energy is present in food. Has so anyone got any uh, snack food they're munching on here somewhere? People are inhuman weirdos. When I was in college, we brought chips and cupcakes. And, oh, great. Like people are drinking water and... Oh, dietary bars. That's wrong with people. All right. This will just have to do, I guess. So, this uh, dietary bar here has 120 calories. There. That's how he keeps his slim figure. It's those dietary granola bars. Let me get the name right There. Now, think about that. So, Patrick's granola bar there has 120 calories. That's actually quite a bit of energy, isn't it? So that has enough energy to either heat up 120 grams of water by 1 degree C, or this is enough energy to heat up 1 gram of water by 120 degrees C. That's a large amount of energy, isn't it? Wow. Or is it worse? How does a bar heat up water? Who? <laughs> I don't see how a bar heats up water. You have to burn it. And it's water. I don't, I'm not connecting. What happens, uh, well I'm not going to talk about metabolism here, because that's kind of beyond the scope of this course, but imagine there's a giant fire inside of you. So what happens when you eat stuff is it's burned. You breathe in oxygen, you're burning your food in the oxygen, that's how much heat energy is produced. Okay. And we're not going to do this to Patrick, but we could burn his bar, say, in a calorimeter and determine exactly how many calories burn it that way. I was thinking about Simpsons where Homer is watching a donut being incinerated and he's screaming. Is it, yeah. Every, yeah. yeah, you see where I'm going. So, so do you want to get campfire use a Whopper knife? Like a Burger King? Sure. <laughs> it's full of grease. That'll light right up, too. Anyway, back to this here. So, Patrick's granola bar has an extraordinary amount of energy in it. But, as it turns out, it's much, much worse than it looks. Any of you guys on a diet right now? No, you're good. Because if you're on a diet, you do not want to hear this. Turns out, 
Patrick's granola bar right there doesn't really have 120 calories. Notice a subtle thing here. This has a capital C. This has a lowercase c. That's very important here because 120 calories is equal to 120,000 calories. Capitalization makes all the difference here. So, Patrick's simple granola bar right there contains enough energy to heat up 120,000 grams of water by 1 degree C, or, if you want to go crazy, you can heat up 1 gram of water by 120,000 degrees C. Man, that's a lot of energy right there. But, if you're getting too worried about this, you know how the uh, food labels say you're allowed to have 2,000 calories every day? That's a lie. It's really how many calories? A lot. Two million. Two million. So, as bad as this sounds right here, it's not so bad that you consider you're actually allowed to eat two million calories every day. How's anyone ever gained weight? You've got two million calories you can eat. Bacon burgers. Well, here's the thing here. So, Patrick, you're going to eat that granola bar later, right? At some point. At some point. What is Patrick going to do with all this energy? That's a lot of energy right there. <laughs> well, it turns out, of the 2 million calories many of us consume every day, where does that energy go? Exercise? Walking around? No. Any of you guys who exercise know the horrible truth about this. If you jog like two miles, you'll burn off the calories in one small Chips Ahoy cookie. That's the way exercise works. Exercise is pointless in terms of burning calories. It's uh, way too many calories involved there. So where does all the energy you eat every day go? Where does the uh, two million calories go? Turns out almost all of it goes to keeping you warm. You guys are warm-blooded creatures. The room temperature in this room right now is around 20 degrees Celsius. Does anyone know what the body temperature of a human is in Celsius? Close. I'm impressed. Now, none of you are playing to practice medicine, are you? So if you're working over in Europe and someone comes in with a body temperature of 30 degrees C, you're going to say, yeah, they're fine. No one knows. 37 degrees C. That's human body temperature in Celsius. So where does all the 2 million calories we eat every day go? Almost all of it just goes to keeping you warm. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, you have to keep your body at 37 degrees C, even though your surrounding temperature is much, much less. It takes a lot of energy to keep you warm. That's where it all goes. And that's why if you've ever owned a reptile like a snake, a snake can eat a rat and be happy for like a month. That's all the calories they need because snakes are cold-blooded, so they don't need anywhere near the caloric intake we warm-blooded mammals need. We need vast amounts of energy. Yes? Sir, if you live in Alaska, you're going to lose more weight? I've always, uh, apparently yes. I've always thought about this. If I ever decide to quit teaching, what I'll do is I'll have Haas, Haas's Miracle Diet Plan. I'll charge you a thousand bucks and I'll just lock you into a, an empty freezer over the weekend. Just be sitting there freezing all weekend, burning thousands of calories, the way will just shed right off. I'm going to do that one of these days. Okay. Um, you know, since our temperature is 98.6, using Fahrenheit, it's easier for me. But if it was 98.6 degrees outside, we think it was hot. Wouldn't, shouldn't that be like perfect, like we feel comfortable? Well, when you say your normal body temperature is 98.6, that's your core temperature. Your skin is actually quite a bit cooler. So that's why you feel warm, because your insides are 98.6, but your outsides maybe 94, 93, or less. 